Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you guys for joining Hila CLE uh, this month. We have a special guest, Mr. Scott West. Uh, you know, he, he's one of the goats in personal injury right now, if I say so myself. Um, I'm going to give you a pretty, a pretty good brief uh, introduction of Scott. So Scott West was born and raised in the north side of Houston. He went to Eisenhower High School, where he learned to dance, fight, and, and, and negotiate. He was stabbed in the shoulder in his sophomore year, which was God's way of telling him that his college football quarterback career was not in his future, and perhaps he should explore other works opportunities. Scott is no stranger to work. Hard work pays off. That's not only his mantra, but now he lives in his, how he lives his life. And this is how he and his wife of 30 years raised their family. At the age of 13, Scott washed windows in a shopping center. That would later prove significant in his personal life and in his legal career. I think he'll tell you about that this afternoon. Scott received his degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Texas in Austin in 1985, where he was on the Dean's List and member of Tau Beta Pi, an honor fraternity for engineers. He, he also worked for a subcontractor for the Air Force near Dallas, Texas. That's where I'm from, Gray City. He ultimately moved back to Houston where he worked as a design engineer in the transportation and refinery industries. After working two years as an engineer, Scott went back to school at South Texas School of Law, College of Law in 1987. He was working during the day and, and also going to school at night. While at South Texas, Scott was able to clerk for Jim Purdue Sr which proved to be the most rewarding and insightful pre-lawyer job he could have ever imagined. So Scott West worked at a Houston personal injury law firm from 1990 all the way up to 1997, at which time he opened up the West Law Firm, which is based in Sugarland, Texas. He's a triple board certified, which is very rare to see. He's also passionate about his family, he's passionate about his clients, and he's passionate about life as well. Back in 2018, I clerked for Scott where he taught me just about everything that I know um, in regards to personal injury. He's also been a friend to me. He's been a mentor to me. Please, I want to welcome guys, Scott West, to the state. Well, thanks, George. So uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, judges and lawyers and law students alike. Uh, I've been asked to talk about what a successful PI practice is. And I think to start that, you have to define success. And that may be different from one person to another. You know, is it money? Is it recognition? Do you wanna make a difference? And at the, at the core, we as lawyers and, and most of these, most of the lawyers that I hang out with are plaintiffs, personal injury lawyers, we represent people, families, and individuals who've been affected by either somebody's uh, conduct or a defective product or a situation that changes the path of their life, either individually or their family. And so one of the initial questions about success, when we talk about a successful PI practice, is, is what do you want to do? I mean, you, you want to leave a legacy or do you want a, a monument? Do you, you want to change people's lives? or do you want a statue? I would submit that if you change people's lives and you do that through whatever God's gifts to you are as an advocate, as, as one who studies the law and one who enters their life at a very vulnerable and confusing time, I'd submit that that is a longer term success than if you um, if, if they name a, a courtroom after you or a building or a statue. So it, it, as you define a successful PI practice, you probably also have to reach down deep and define who you are and what is your practice? What do you want to do? And, and I don't know, Georgia, the, the Houston Young Lawyers, is it just plaintiff's personal injury lawyers or are there, there are other lawyers involved in HYLA? There's uh, uh, other lawyers involved, but uh, for the most part, I think um, we have a lot of people that's interested in personal injury and uh, just any tips uh, for the most part. And we want this to be a conversation as well. So to all the attendees, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. I'll bring them up to Scott and then that way you guys can have any type of communication and converse. Yeah, and, and, and so as, as I focus on a successful PI practice, you have to figure out what it is that makes you tick. And, and I think it 
all boils down to one word, and that's relationships. And we as plaintiffs, personal injury lawyers, have an opportunity that insurance defense lawyers generally do, they, don't, they don't get, and that is to form relationships with our clients that are long lasting. I, I have one family that I represented, their, their son was killed in 1994. I, I still, not every year, but I often go to their uh, family reunion. And, and here we are uh, almost 30 years later because those are long-term relationships. When I, I think if you pursue a successful practice, if you get away from, or hopefully never get into your clients, your, the, the, the people that you represent being a file number, that it's a real person. I think that that will help you in a long-term success of a legacy and, and, and helping and, and changing people's lives. And, you know, and, and nothing against insurance defense lawyers. There, there are some good ones out there. There's some that not so much, but uh, I, I have some good relationships with, with some defense lawyers out there, but, but the nature of what they do is different than what we're called to do. You know, we, we sometimes see insurance defense lawyers come over from the dark side, we say, you know, to represent individuals. Uh, rarely we see it go the other way for whatever reason, but uh, I, I was fortunate to, to start off in the plaintiff's PI practice in 1990, you know, straight out of law school, and we talk about that. But again, getting back to the relationships, you know, the, the I, I, I heard when I was in law school that, that the law is a jealous mistress. It, it can suck all of the life out of you and, and take away from your family. So I would encourage you, I would challenge you and, and warn you to not let the law take over your life. You, you got to have good family balance. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm very fortunate. My wife of, of 30 years was in the legal profession and she's done a great job of keeping me tethered to the family because you have to have family time. That's part of your relationships. That's part of, of, of what forms you as a lawyer to be able to communicate to juries and to judges ultimately and, and, and that's those life experiences. And so I encourage you to, to, to find that balance. And, you know, when we get ready for trial or we're in trial to be sure we're, we're hyper-focused on that, nothing wrong with that. But when you're not in trial, when you're not prepared for that big deposition or that big mediation or, or presentation, uh, make, make family time uh, because that balance, that relationship is so very, very important. Uh, your relationships with your clients are very important and, and not to be taken for granted. You, you, you don't want to be all there for them. And then when they sign up, then you're gone, right? In, until trial or prepare for deposition the week before uh, and they deal with staff members. And it's difficult. Yeah, you know, nothing about what we do is, is easy. But that relationship that you form with your clients is long-term, you know, relationships are, are like wine. You can't pick grapes on Monday, crush them Tuesday and drink wine on Wednesday. They take time to form and take time to formulate and take time to gel. And I believe strongly that jurors and judges see that. If, if you have a client that you've not spent time with, whether it's on the phone or Zoom nowadays or face-to-face, to, to really know them, not just the answers to the interrogatories, not just did you see any other doctors other than these, not just how you recovering after your surgery, not just that, but you find out about them. And that's a challenge. And, and to have a successful PI practice requires that relationship to be nurtured and fed and formed because I don't know about y'all, but, but I'm not an actor. If I don't believe in my case, I, I can't get the jury to champion the, the cause of, of my client. And so if I have a real relationship, a real genuine, uh, integrous relationship where I've spent time with them, I, I, I know about them. I know their heart. I know what, what uh, their concerns are. I know what the, their struggles are, even though I don't actually walk through their, their shoes it, it helps me in that relationship and it'll help you too 
when you go into the courtroom uh, to, to champion that cause for that person who can't do it for themselves. If they could do it for themselves, they wouldn't have hired you. So the, the, the client relationship is so very, very important. The relationships within your firm uh, are, are also important. You know, the, the, the wheels of justice can grind to a slow halt when, when the people that you work with uh, don't do their job. And I've always found that, that, that people lead better than they push. And that when you form a relationship with the people that you work with, if they want to do that job, if they respect you and they, they truly love and are passionate about what they do, then they just do a better job. And as a team, as a family, as a firm, the entire process uh, goes better. So I, I've you know, practiced a lot of product liability uh, law in the last 31 years. And I guess you know, the, it kind of hit me last week after George had asked me to speak to the Houston Young Lawyers, I guess I'm really, really old uh, because I'm probably been practicing law longer than some of y'all have been alive. And so uh, I guess I'll have to go take a nap after this seminar. But the, 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 the firm members that you have are, are truly the lifeblood of, of your team, of, of your arsenal to fight for your clients. And, and as I've traveled around the nation and, and dealt with different firms, big firms, small firms, medium-sized firms, I've seen, uh, I've seen lawyers that, that are um, not nice to, the, to, their, to their staff. And, and, that, and that's offensive. That's not a good relationship to have. And so I encourage you to appreciate the people that, that work with you and, and help you do what you need to do uh, for your clients. And, you know, whether it's a, you know, I'm not talking about a, a money bonus, but, you know, pat them on the back, you know, bring, bring in lunch, bring in tips, treats, you know, let them have a Friday uh, afternoon off if, if, you're, if you're slow. I think that's really important. Uh, relationships go beyond that, though. You, you, you form relationships with your jurors, whether it's a two-day case or a month-long case. You know, you, you, you have to have that relationship with jurors that starts at Vordar and goes through breaks. And as you're coming into the courthouse and leaving the courthouse, because jurors see and they're perceptive and they'll see whether you're genuine or whether you're trying to pull the wool over their eyes. Because, look, as plaintiffs, PI lawyers, you know, we're the butt of a lot of jokes and people come to uh, to, to a party or, or bring to the courthouse a certain prejudgment or prejudice about, you know, that we're just greedy, that we don't really care. And so we got two strikes against us and we're stepping up to the plate and we got Nolan Ryan on the mound. It's, it's, a, it's a tough job what we do. But again, if it was easy, everybody would do it. But if, if obviously it, it's your calling uh, or, or, or you think it's your calling because you're here. This is what you're doing or preparing to do, and you want to have a successful PI practice. So your relationship with that jury, you, you, you've got to be respectful. You've got to be real. Uh, you have to be considerate. Uh, you, you can't be condescending. You can't be can't talk down to them. Just like any relationship. And so you're forming a relationship with, and then fill in the blank. But it goes to the jurors. Uh, something that I've seen uh, also over the years is court personnel. I've seen lawyers that treat court personnel so poorly. And if you don't think that those court personnel let that judge know who's respectful and who's not, then you're fooling yourself. So uh, if you know, we've got a relatively small uh, courthouse down here in, in Fort Wayne County. And when, when we have, when Madison, my daughter, and I have have hearings here, uh, we'll go down uh, and have our hearing. But we'll stop into another courtroom just to say hi to the staff. Judge may not be on the bench. Say hi to the staff. Hey, how you doing? The bailiffs and, and the support personnel, because those folks can make things happen or they can make them not happen. And they're human beings. And so if the only time you call somebody, if the only time somebody called you is if they needed something, it just doesn't feel right. And so just take a little time to, to form and nurture and, and um, sustain that relationship with the court personnel. You know, insurance adjusters 
are uh, an interesting breed. Uh, some of them have drank the Kool-Aid and every claimant is a liar and a fraud and a cheat and they're waiting for the lawsuit lottery and uh, sitting on the couch watching Oprah and eating bonbons all day waiting for their check at the end of the case. I, 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 we, we, <laughs> we've been very fortunate that we, we, don't, we don't have clients like that. And, and, but adjusters believe that, that that's some adjusters. That, that that's who we represent. We, you got to form that relationship with the adjuster by being decent to them and also letting them know that, that this person's not that person, that they're, they're not happy they were hurt. They were, they're not happy that they're in this situation. They don't want to be, uh, have their lives disrupted and have to go to the doctor and, and, and have the, uh, the, the disruption in their life both physically and emotionally and, and as a practical standpoint. But, you know, the, the adjusters are, or risk managers in a, in a case where you have a self-insured uh, company, the, the, those are the purse strings, right? And, and ultimately, in, a, in an injury case, our objective, our, our long-term objective, and, and we'll get to kind of case planning in a little bit, in a couple of hours, I'm probably, but the, the, uh, the, the objective is to get full and fair compensation for our clients. And if, and if, if you have a good relationship with that adjuster versus, a, I can't say pissy one, but, a, but a, an adverse one with them where they're fighting against you instead of fighting for you, then, then the road is longer, the road is rougher, the, the road has more turns than if you have a good relationship with them. They don't have to agree with everything you say, but if you, from the beginning, uh, uh, if you nurture or you garner their respect for how you handle the case, uh, how you are representing your client, how you document your file, then that helps to form uh, relationships, you know, with the adjusters. And you know, there's a lot of turnover for in, in a lot of the uh, a lot of the insurance companies. And I get it, but from time to time, we'll we get the same adjusters. I've, I've you know, a, a, a great honor that I had years ago was, was I had an adjuster from Travelers that I had a case with and she was high up and her niece was, was injured about five or six years after the last case I had with her. And she referred her niece to me, not for a referral fee, because she truly, I guess, appreciated how I represented my clients. It's a big honor because she knows, uh, and still to this day is, is an adjuster. Uh, a lot of a lot of lawyers in the Houston area, and, and could have sent uh, her niece to anybody, and so that's that's a big deal. That's that's when you know that you may very well be on the the right path with that relationship. Again, we're still on the relationships aspect of what we do. Uh, defense lawyers, you know, I mentioned them before. You know, it's it's an interesting breed, and it's an interesting and delicate balance with defense lawyers because that's there, there are opponents right there are opposing counsel and you you could have an opponent that's not your enemy again they don't have to agree with what you say but but if you do it in the right way if you document your file if you are prepared and you present with with you know integrity and um, and you've worked the the, the file up then, then they will respect how you do that. Uh, the, the, there are some that are unreachable. You know, I don't need to mention the names here, but if you contact me separately, we probably have the, the, the same, uh, it's relatively short list, but there's some of them that are just died in the wool. Not, not good people in, in my mind. You're not gonna be able to have a relationship with them. And that's all right. Just know that at the outset, plan accordingly, but, but, you know, there are a lot of, of decent uh, defense lawyers, even in-house uh, defense lawyers. You know, they're overworked and underpaid. You don't want to tell them that because that might be condescending, but, but they are. They're, they're not appreciated. Uh, they're overworked. And uh, if, whatever you can do in that relationship with them to present your claim, your case differently, uh, may allow you some avenues to better represent your client. To, for the end goal, and that is full and fair compensation for whatever it is that they have, have suffered and sustained in a shorter period of time. So the, uh, uh, you know, George mentioned 
uh, me washing windows at 13. And that's a true story. So there's a lady named Bobby Tremaine. And you look this up. Uh, Bobby had a, a little uh, interior shop in Antoine and Little York, Little York the neighborhood I lived in. And I used to wash all the windows in that neighborhood. And she told me something. She says, Scott, you cannot change the world, but you can change your little corner of it. And I was 13 years old. I still remember this day her saying that. Well, about five years ago, six years ago, her daughter reached out to me on Facebook and said, my mama was in a car wreck. Can you represent her? And so I reached back out. I remember Miss Bobby, she, you know, she had a, 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 an uninsured motorist claim. Uh, she was 80 something years old, had a back injury, was rear ended, had surgery. The surgery didn't do any good. We went to trial, Judge Weems Court in uh, 2019 and against Louis Fabrega, good lawyer, good guy. And it's fifty thousand dollar policy, State Farm. They did, they offered you know, five or six or eight thousand dollars. We tried the case, and we tried it on non economic damages only. The 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 change in Bobby Tremaine's life. We didn't present any medical bills. That you know, Bobby said, "Look, the surgery didn't do any good." So I told the jury, "We're not going to present any medical bills to you because the surgery she had didn't do any good." And we we did that, but Bobby and I walked down memory lane, and the jury loved the relationship that Bobby Tremaine and I had for 40 plus years. And they wanted to know about that. And we argued for $180,000. The jury was so mad at me that I didn't argue for more. I mean, you can't tell them that there's a $50,000 cap. They awarded $200,000 in non-economic damages uh, to Bobby Tremaine. And I'm telling you, it's not because she had a great lawyer. It's because her lawyer and her had a great relationship and they loved Bobby Tremaine Bobby Tremaine formed a relationship with that jury in the time that she was on that stand as a fighter. And that jury came and championed her cause uh, because they loved Bobby Tremaine. But, you know, who knew, you know, back when I was just a snotty nosed kid need money so I could fix my Schwinn bicycle, uh, that, that washing windows for this lady would produce, number one, that nugget of life about changing my little corner of the world. And then later on, produce a, a claim, which, you know, it, it, was, it was a big claim for her, uh, not just the money aspect, but because the insurance company didn't believe her. But at the end of that, the jury believed her. That was a big deal for her. And that was, you know, that was a, a neat case to have handled uh, for, for Miss Bobby. So we're in this, this successful PI practice for the long haul, it's the long game, right? And so you've got to balance out, you know, aspects of your life, understanding this is a marathon. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a sprint. And so as you generate your, uh, or formulate your, your, your relationships with, you know, with your family, with your firm, with your client, with, with the you know, court personnel, with adjusters, and, and jurors and defense lawyers understand it's a long game. Be decent, be human. It's not always easy. Uh, the, the, and and I, I fail miserably from time to time and I'll get into it with another lawyer. Uh, but that's, that's, it's wasted energy. You, know, you can be passionate about what you do and, and fight for what you believe in. Because if you don't believe in it, then you really are in the wrong business and you'll never have a successful PI practice. You'll turn over some cases and you'll make some fees, but if you're not passionate about it, if you don't truly care about the people that, are, that, that come to you, then at least my definition of success, you're not gonna ever have a successful practice. You keep some lights on, you get you a fancy new car and some you know, shiny wheels, but that can all go away. You, your, your successful practice comes, you formulate relationships, you, you change lives, you have balance in your own life with, with the people that you love, the people who work with you, the people who you are around, and, and the people who hire you and give you this, this box of, of, of trouble, right? Whatever trouble they're in, they give you this box. And it's most of the time not organized. Uh, it, it's uh, discombobulated and it's disconcerted. And, and it's your job to take that box 
and just spread it out on a table and sort it out and, and help them through the, the a very trying time. And depending on the degree of injury, that it may be the most trying time of their life. I mean, you know, there are some injuries that are catastrophic and, and life changing and, and that they'll live with forever, no matter how much compensation that, that you obtain for them from an adjuster or from a, a self-insured company or from a jury. The, 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 the last long lasting effects of many of the injuries, uh, they don't stop there. So don't forget that, you know, it's not just a, a, a check to uh, someone who's lost a loved one or, or lost the ability to, to fully function uh, physically or emotionally. And, um, you know, a, a great friend here in, in, in Houston, uh, just last week lost a, a client to suicide because of the emotional effects of, of, the, in, of the injury that she sustained. And, and she succumbed to that. And that, that hit him hard. He, he's a great lawyer, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And, and, and that shows his passion for his client. And, and sometimes we forget the true effects that they go beyond your pay to incur and here's some scarring and oh, here's a good picture of some scarring and all that's important to be sure in developing a case, but don't dehumanize the client or the client. Is it me or is Scott frozen? Can someone in the chat confirm me? Okay. Well, yeah, so it seems like Scott's frozen. Let's give him a couple of minutes so he can uh, join us again. But no worries. Um, I'll try to echo as much as I can for what Scott was saying, even though he's been in here for 30 years and I'm going on my second year of practice, but. Scott did teach me just about everything I, I do know. And one thing about Scott, um, what I've learned about his relationships with people and uh, just around the courthouse is that it moves mountains, honestly. Um, you never know when what you may come, okay, we have Scott coming in. I'll finish my sentence, but you never know just what you may do and who you may come across. Uh, like Scott said, when you're with your opposing counsel, they can be your friend or they can be your foe, but ultimately it can honestly help you guys reach a, a settlement and Scott showed me that throughout these years but you guys are here to hear from, hear from Scott so I'm gonna let him take over I don't know what happened George I know where I I go I Dan gave a little commercial break <laughs> what was the commercial Cheerios uh, just echoing exactly what you were saying you know from the time that I spent working with you and how I've personally seen it uh, relationship, how they can really help a case. And we did one not too long ago out there in Fort Bend. And honestly, we, we appeared before one judge and that relationship that we did with that one judge, I have another case in front of him. And I can already tell you that just the relationships that we have just from working with you on that one side is carried over. You know, and, 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 and again, you know, back to the long game, you know, be human, be decent, be civil, be honest. Because if, if you... If you sell yourself out, right? If you if you compromise your integrity, you still got to look at yourself in the mirror, right? At the end of each day or the next morning, and 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 if you do that, and and if you lie to a judge, there's a difference between lying or misrepresenting and good advocacy, and people don't like to be lied to. You know, it's, it's a, a very personal thing to them. And so when, when because we're in this long game the, and, and back to the relationships, if you mislead a court, I dare say you are years to regain that trust. Look, we're all human. We all fall short, you know, all, no question about it. You know, all of our feet are made of clay. But the if, if you mislead, a judge, if you tell a judge, the case says this and it doesn't, or there are no cases on that and there are. 
or you know, judge this happened or that happened. If, if you make a mistake, you come with hat in hand and you say, judge, I made a mistake. I, I misstated that. I wasn't trying to mislead the court. You've got to own that. But if you do that, if you mislead a court or, or another lawyer even, then I, I think that the, the repercussions of that are, are so difficult to overcome and they should be, but you got to do something to make it right. But so we're in the long game. We're here for a long time, hopefully. And so do it, do it right. You know, and, and, and whatever right is, uh, you know, you know, what's not right. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I suspect, you know, I, I, I heard, uh, George, I think you, you welcome Judge Hall. Uh, maybe there's some other judges and, and, and maybe she sees it uh, the same way or, or differently. Maybe she could, could chat to you uh, about, you know, lawyers that, that mislead. Again, there's a difference between good advocacy and misrepresenting to the court. And when you do that, I just think that it's, uh, it's very, very bad. Uh, and, and it's not good for the long game in, in what we do in the respect and the relationships that we need to have. So, you know, as, as we, uh, as we get ready for trial and, and, and as the, the world is opening back up to, to trials, you know, stresses, um, the, the stressors in our, in our world, what we do legally, right? Different people respond differently to stress. So, you know, my personal deal is, you know, as we get closer to trial, my heart rate goes down and you just kind of chill out. You know, Kenny Chesney said it right, everything's going to be all right. And so it, it, if you stress out more, it exacerbates the problem. You know, you, you don't want to hurry up and freak out because that's just going to exacerbate the problem. So when, when you have good balance in, in how you perceive a case, how you develop a case, how you're approaching trial, and we'll get to some nuts and bolts of, of some trial presentation in just a second. George, I think I've been talking about a half hour, uh, in, in, and I'm sorry, I'm, but I'm, I promise you I'm going to get into nuts and bolts of, of, of actually developing a lawsuit. But th this stuff is so important right now, th these foundational aspects of, of relationships, Right and 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 balance and um, the, the long term. That I think that those foundational aspects are important before we get into the to, to the details. Um, but so far, George, do we have any questions? Anybody? Any comments? I don't have my glasses on, so, so I can't see very well. Yes, we have uh, two comments on questions. Someone says, "Good job and great advice," and Judge Hall says, "Here, here." And then um, you have a chance from Mr. O'Neill to form a relationship with him. His question is, for defense lawyers in the audience, what are two good things you wish all defense lawyers did on every case you see them on? And then what are two bad things you would tell a defense lawyers to never do on cases again? Man, I like that question, Mr. O'Neill. And I, I invite you to call me so that I can form a relationship with you. My email is scott at westfirm.com. And I mean that in all sincerity. So... I think that if defense lawyers concede without admitting liability, okay, you can, you can, you can do this in, in, in a settlement uh, uh, posture so it's protected under Rule 408, right? So if you concede certain things that should be conceded, I think that you, that you buy credibility with the other side, just like, just like you know, on, on the plaintiff side. Look, you know, every every case has fleas. You know, I've, I've heard somebody else say that. So, you know, all, all your cases are going to have some some bad fact, but own it, right? You 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 embrace it, whether it's an exacerbation of a pre-existing condition, you own that, and and, and or whether it's somebody with, with who made some decision or made some bad choices in in the in their history and, and uh, maybe had a run in with the law. Or two or three, but but you, if if they if you own the bad facts and you concede to those, uh, and and you you have that uh, you have that credibility that I believe you 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 get as a defense lawyer when you say yeah you my guy slammed into the back of yours uh, pretty hard and and uh, for the purposes of settlement 
probably should have been paying attention. You can always couch it. You can always qualify it so it doesn't come back and say, you know, Mr. O'Neill told me that his client did it on purpose or, or that he wasn't paying attention. It's not that. But in your conversations, and I, I do, look, we're in kind of an instant gratification uh, society now where you can look up, you know, stuff on your phone and you can find out, you know, whatever you want to know about the Edmund Fitzgerald without actually having to go to the library to look it up, which was a boat that went down in Lake Superior and 29 people died. But anyway, so, but you can, you can do that and, and we get away from the relationships. Back to the first thing I was talking about, right? Relationships is at the core of what we do. Pick up a phone, be decent, give extensions on deadlines that really don't matter. Right. You know, because a judge is probably going to give not because but a judge is probably going to give it anyway, but just be decent. One day you're going to need an extension, whether it's, you know, filing counter affidavits or it, it's an expert discovery or expert or discovery deadline or, or so it's, it's a Friday and somebody's got, you know, their, their, their son or daughter has a, a sports game or a birthday and they've got some discovery due. Come on, man. Give them an extension. Your trials in 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 12, 18 months, and, you, and you're worried about whether they got to answer some discovery on a Friday. It, it, balance, man, balance. It's the long game. You'll need something someday, and even if you don't, it's the right thing to do. It's the decent thing to do. So, for, back to O'Neill's question, and then I'll, I'll get back to some of my talking points. You know, the pick up a phone. And, and, and call, you know, I, I get when you get to be my age, you, you got to see some of the same lawyers on the other side. And, and it's great to pick up a phone and, and talk to them. Maybe they're at the same firm, maybe they're not. And, and uh, but, you know, to, to have a relationship with them uh, by, by telephone, have lunch, you know, go have a drink, whether it's Coca-Cola or Crown, whatever it is you have, go, go have a drink with them. I'm, I don't like Coca-Cola, it's too much sugar. But the, 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 the relationship aspect is something. I had, uh, I had a dinner uh, two weeks ago with Bob Brown, you know, a lawyer with Donato Minks and Brown, great lawyer. Had a lot of, 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 uh, a lot of uh, cases with him o over the, uh, the years. We weren't even calling, I wouldn't even want to talk about a case. I just wanted to see how he was doing. You know, so you can't do that with everybody, but you can form relationships and you can spend some time with them. So um, let, let's talk about actual uh, cases, right? So every case is different, but every case is the same. But th there are some aspects. Did I lose you, George? Or you lose me? I'm going to keep talking unless somebody chats otherwise. So, so. No, so, so the, the a, a personal injury case, the anatomy of a personal injury case, whether it's a, a an amputation case or a death case or an explosion case or a product case or or a, a relatively garden variety car wreck case, really there are some aspects that are the same. You know, not every case will justify from an economic standpoint hiring an accident reconstructionist. Not everyone you need to, or a biomechanical engineer or a design engineer. Again, the different cases have different aspects, but there are certain parts, certain anatomy of a personal injury case that you have from each one, right? From, from, from case to case. Uh, you, you, you have your initial notice, you, you have some written discovery, you have some depositions, you have some hearings. The um, Written discovery, and, and there are a lot of different, I guess, perspectives on written discovery. Uh, I, I'm a, not a big believer in interrogatories other than identifying people and categories of documents because lawyers answer that. You know, the client swears to them that they're true and correct answers, and it, it gets good background information, to be sure. You, you got to have that. You know, name, rank, serial number, then, you know, time of day, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I don't think it's effective. So, you know, at the time of the collision, you know, tell me everything you did to avoid the collision or something like that. I just don't think those are effective interrogatories. And I'm not trying to, to, to dissuade somebody from asking them, but I would ask you to maybe look at it a different way. Use interrogatories to identify people, objective uh, facts, 
uh, in, in, in categories of documents if, if, if it's a case that has uh, that aspect. But take depositions, spend time taking depositions. You don't have to have a stenographer. You don't have to have a videographer. We, we tend to video and, and, and every deposition because there are some nuggets that you just don't read as well as they play from a video standpoint. Even if you put it to, you send it to an adjuster, uh, it, 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 it can drive a point home. But you can do non-stenographic depositions, and it's good practice for young lawyers and, and for old lawyers. You know, to, to have a, a, a witness, whether it's a defendant or a, or a witness or a police officer, take depositions. It's good trial practice. It, it's good w whether you have a friendly witness or an adverse witness. It, it's just good to do. And with the advent of the non-stenographic depositions allowed specifically under the rules, there's no reason not to. Don't be scared. Jump in and, and grab a hold of a, of a deponent and, and take a deposition. So, uh, it, but it's back to written discovery. So you have interrogatories, requests for production, requests for admissions. Requests for production are important, but I believe requests for admissions are far underused. Uh, you, can, you can hone in on the issues. You can define the issues that are contested, and those that are not. And, and I tend to send, to, to, uh, uh, send uh, competing requests for admissions. You know, it, it, admit it's your contention that the plaintiff was negligent. Admit it's your, not your contention. So they got, they got to pick one or the other. And then when they, when they deny both, when they, they can't live in harmony, then you, you, you pick up a phone call and say, hey, look, I got to have an admission to one of these or we got to go to the court. And I wouldn't use that as a threat, but you're trying to hone down uh, and zero in on the issues. Uh, something I did years ago, I learned from somebody much smarter than me, which is a, a large population of people. And that is, you know, we would get to trial and all of a sudden the defendant would, would come in or the defense, insurance company, defense lawyer, and say, well, you know, judge, we're stipulating to liability. And now the jury doesn't know any of that until well, there's there's no there's no uh, dispute as to liability, folks. We're just here because plaintiff's lawyer is greedy and, and wants money for the client. But you're like, hang on, we've been doing this dance for two and a half years, and you just last week decided to, or this morning decided you want to stipulate the liability and you want to put on the white hat and act like you're the good guy and I'm the bad guy. No, no, no. So I send requests for admissions. Admit you deny liability. So early on, admit you do not accept responsibility for the collision, the event, whatever. Get them locked down a few times on that. That way, before they can come stipulate, and I'm not saying don't accept the a stipulation of liability, but don't make it so easy on them to where they come in looking like you know the the, the good guy when they haven't been the good guy or gal to be politically correct, for two and a half years or however long the case has been going on. So you get requests for admissions, you know, to, to lock in issues. That's something that uh, I think a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of lawyers don't utilize uh, admissions. Um, at the beginning of a case, I think just like you, you don't want to go on, on, a, on a journey walking through uh, the woods without some plan. Where, where are you headed? Right. Even if you get on the road, say, oh, I'm going to go up to Georgia's old stomping grounds in Dallas. You know, you still know, OK, I'm going to go 45 north. Right. I'm going to stop at Bucky's. I'm going to go through here. But you, you have kind of a plan. I think it's a good idea in an injury case or in any case, for that matter, to, to have a plan of where you want to go. Mr. O'Neill and the other uh, defense lawyers, y'all are more in a reactive mode, I believe. But, but you know, as the plaintiff. As a person with the with party with a burden of proof, which you embrace it, you, you gladly accept that burden. You're going to discharge that burden and, and you go forward. You need a plan. You, you need a, a, an affirmative, offensive, assertive plan and not just, OK, well, we haven't haven't sent any discovery, so I'm going to send some discovery. Well, haven't looked at this file in a while, so probably ought to take a deposition. You, you know, have a plan. You know, there, there's a 30 day curse. Right, because they don't teach us in law school, but they teach us in the law. You know, you, you have thirty days to respond to you know just about anything. Well, so many of us are guilty of on day twenty nine. Well, let me look at them for the first time. 
you know, it, it, it's, it's, if you can put in a check and balance system to where you, you don't have that, we've tried to implement and we've been pretty good back, you know, on the request for disclosure, you know, when, when those, those form requests were formed, we know what they're gonna be, right? And so you file the lawsuit and while the defendant is being served, you know what those requests are. So go ahead and start putting those answers, those responses together so that when the defendant answers, you said not necessarily that day, that may be a little aggressive, we've done it. But you know, a few days later, a week later, send them your full set of medical, send them your photographs, send them those responses. It shows that you're on top of it. It shows that, that you care about your case and that you are uh, organized and, and you know how your work product appears to the other side. I believe the optics make a difference. You know, whether you have, whether it's sloppy, you know, whether it's well formatted, whether it's well put together, you know, I mean, with, with the, the uh, word documents and forms that you want to tweak to your own style, uh, there's no reason for there to be, in my mind, sloppy uh, work. So, so formulate a plan, uh, don't fall into the 30 day curse, have your check and balance, you know, have, have people, uh, everybody to understand their role in the process of, of developing uh, facts in the case. You know, network is so important. This right here, whether there's 20 people on or 120 people on, it doesn't matter. There, there's a group of people out here that wants you to be successful in your PI practice and in helping your clients. You know, pick up a phone. They, George can never call me and it's too late and I won't answer his question. You know, and, 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 and I'd feel the same with George. Hey, George, I got a question about this. You and John, y'all have an insight on this. What about this? You know, look, look, this is what we do for a living, right? But, but we're still passionate about it. We still care about it. We still love what we do. And I love answering questions if I can, if I have some information for somebody. I invite people to, to contact me all the time. And, and if I can add some insight, and again, it goes back to the to the networking and the relationships. You know, all boats rise and fall with the tide, and so help each other out. Whether it's insight on a witness or insight on a defense lawyer or insight on a uh, insight on a, a situation, a defendant, right? So uh, the 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 networking is, is really important amongst your fellow uh, plaintiff lawyers. Sometimes I'll I'll call a defense lawyer friend, say, "Hey, I got this." defense lawyer or this defendant that's doing this, what do you read into that? Sometimes they'll answer you, sometimes you're not. You don't have to give them names, but you're looking for insight. You're not looking to, to, to trick somebody. So uh, again, formulate a plan for your case, know where you're going, know what your plan is on, on that specific case. Um, don't be afraid of hearings, you know, go down, but, but don't, don't, don't do them on, I mean, the court's time is valuable. The court, the judges are there to help us, but they're also, they're, they're not kindergarten teachers to, to, to break up a fight over a crayon box. You know, certain things, I don't wanna say don't bother the court with, but you, you ought to be able to work things, most things out. And, and I, I think I had a, a, a former judge that was of counsel with me for years, and I just cherished the time that he was, he was here with me for 20 years. He gave me so much good insight from a, from that side of the bench because discovery disputes are so much of what judges hear. But if you're whining, if it's petty, uh, judge, the answers were due on Tuesday and I didn't get any documents till Thursday. If you step back and go, look, man, long game. It, it didn't really matter. Did they waive objections? Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that you that you don't hold them accountable to that, uh, but but have hearings on things that matter. You may have ten questions or ten requests that that they didn't respond to. It's a pretty good chance that all ten are not critical to your case. So I wouldn't overwhelm the court with with each and every request that you don't feel like you got the right answer to. So maybe pick and choose. Though. George, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, I was trying to jump in. I feel like I'm playing double dutch. Uh, speaking of, of course, we got a question from Judge Hall. She says, 
what do you think most that you wish courts would do and then would not do? I wish all the courts would just rule for me. It would be a lot easier in my practice if they would just say Mr. West wins. But failing that, um, I, I, I have found really an evolution in, in, in judges that they are well-read in the motions that are presented to them. Most judges have, have prepared on the, the matters being presented to them. And that is so appreciated. And so I think it's important, either the, the lawyer asks the judge or the judge lets the lawyers know, you know, counsel, I, I've, I've read uh, the briefing. I uh, don't need you to regurgitate all of that, but I perhaps to identify some issues that need to be expanded upon or uh, clarified if, if they're not clarified. I think it really is incumbent upon the lawyers to ask that of the judge. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, if the judge does not, if the lawyer doesn't do that, then I think the judge needs to, uh, to let the court, let the lawyers know what direction uh, that, that they need. What else, George? So we're approaching the last eight minutes of the CLE. Um, if you guys have any more questions, please fill them out uh, in the chat so I can ask Scott. But in the meantime, make sure that you take down and write down the CLE uh, code that I've posted and I'll repost it just for a moment. Hey, George. Uh, this is Madison hey, West. I'm Scott's daughter. I'm off camera because my power's out, so I don't have makeup on. Um, but I actually have a question, <laughs> um, Dad. Yes. You worked for Jim Purdue Senior, which most people would say is one of the best plaintiff lawyers, uh, und undoubtedly in Texas, if not the country. What were some valuable things that you learned from Jim Purdue Senior as a young lawyer? That I know some of the things you tell me, but what are some things that you could impart on these young lawyers? Yeah. So uh, Jim Purdue Senior, what you know. I mean, he's a very, very uh, important man in my life. I, I didn't know any lawyers, right? I, I knew one, but I didn't really know them until I went to work for, for Mr. Purdue. And he showed me how to care, how to truly care for the people that we represented. You know, and now I, I was in law school and I didn't know what kind of lawyer I wanted to be. And that's okay. But when I, when I ended up at his firm, able to clerk for him and to see the way that Jim Perdue cared for his clients, that's when I said I'm all in because he did. So he, he was a, a magnificent and to this day storyteller because he could bring you in, he could make you understand the story or the plight or the journey that doesn't just end at the end of the verdict, at the end of the case, when you close the file, everybody high fives, we won for them. That friend, that client goes forward. And it's 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 real life. And 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 I think those are the two things, if I just had to say two, that Jim Purdue, but he he just imparted to me how important it is what we do and to care about the people that we represent and and the just the effective communication, the storytelling, how to how to let somebody, let the jury, the judge, the defense lawyer live the, the, the plight or the journey of, of the client. I, I, I learned those uh, from Jim Purdue Sr. and will forever be grateful. Oh, perfect, perfect. George, I see, I, it looks like there's, uh, I, I, on my screen, I see eight uh, in the chat. I don't know what all that is. Were there any other questions or comments? None that I see. Um, all of the questions or comments I kind of already um, spoke on. And then we had that one question from Maddie. But uh, it seems like that they, they, they got what they needed. Um, the cup is running over. I want to really take the time and say thank you, Scott, for, for blessing us with any of this insight over the years. Um, these, you guys have an amazing personal injury law firm. I put his email in the chat um, so you guys can reach him. I know Scott, like he said, I'll call him at 10 o'clock at night or even 11 o'clock. I'm pretty sure he doesn't want that from all 20 of, of you guys, but feel free to email. Bring it on. 
he's, he's a resource and uh, he's, he's a, a whole, whole abundance of knowledge uh, that you guys can really seek and um, tap into. At this time, I think that brings us to a closing for Hyla. Again, thank you guys. And if you guys have any more questions, please email us and then we'll go from there and try to answer anything that we can do to help you guys out. Thank you, George, for asking me. They blessed me and honored me to do this. Thank you again, Scott. You guys take care and good luck on your trial. All right, brother. Thank you. Take care. Good luck to you also next Tuesday. Thank you, sir.